my job as a storyteller is not to master, not to control meaning, but to shed light, to offer story as a gift. Try to do that each week here on Marginal Way. And this week, we are bringing in story that wasn't from our tradition, that isn't from our tradition, but speaks to us in our tradition. We're going to listen to indigenous voices starting today and going on for a whole series. We'll be looking at the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. I hope that you find meaning in this because that's your job to line up the stories, to hear the differences, to hear the similarities, and to listen to the Spirit who will lead you if you're willing to go. Just be ready to go any way the Spirit may lead, including the marginal way. Sewara <laughs> Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Gagnegarunio, Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Ne Gundrop Sutma, Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Ne Odera Sutma, to Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Ne Ohunde Sutma, to Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Ne Odinuma Sutma, to Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Gahit Sutma, to Gadinayota name Guanigura. A quagga Oscar onto the Wahwet Nuni name Guanigura than a day to Nuhorado, Ne Nunqua Sutma. 
Agua go ask on to the walk with noon in it and got Nigura than a day to no horado, Nijin Hequa, to got in Iota name and got Nigura. Agua go ask on to the walk with noon in it and got Nigura than a day to no horado, Nigundario, to got in Iota name and got Nigura. Agua go ask on to the walk with noon in it and got Nigura than a day to no horado, Nigarunda soon out and over a soon on, to got in Iota name and got Nigura. A guego onska onti de wakwet nuni ne unguatni gura da no deiti nu horado ne oji da ogu a to kadi naiota ne unguatni gura. A guego onska onti de wakwet nuni ne unguatni gura da no deiti nu horado ne gaieri ni gawarage ne to kadi naiota ne unguatni gura. A guego onska onti de wakwet nuni ne unguatni gura da no deiti nu horado ne eti satogu radiueras to kadi naiota ne unguatni gura. A guego onska onti the wakwet nuni ne unguat ni gura da no dechi the wat nu horado ne eti the wat ti a jokaneka garakwa to kadi naiota ne unguat ni gura. A guego onska onti the wakwet nuni ne unguat ni gura da no dechi nu horado ne eti sota a sontaneka garakwa to kadi naiota ne unguat ni gura. A guego onska onti the wakwet nuni ne unguat ni gura da no dechi nu horado. Ne oggi sta qua riunio, e tu cadi nei otta ne un guani gura. A guego onska onti da wakwet nuni ne un guani gura, da no dei ci da wak nu horado, ne sun guai a tizu, tu cadi nei otta ne un guani gura. Ona tof ni ore, wakaderi wat kwani, doga o tana zunga ni gorha, isa git ne aiza wata sundurum, tu cadi nei otta ne un guani gura, tok ni gawanage. A sheaf of sweet grass, bound at the end and divided into thirds, is ready to braid. In braiding sweet grass, so that it is smooth, glossy, and worthy of the gift, a certain amount of tension is needed. Of course, you can't do it yourself by tying one end to a chair, or by holding it in your teeth and braiding backward away from yourself. But the sweetest way is to have someone else hold the end so that you can pull gently against each other, all the while leaning in, head to head, chatting and laughing, watching each other's hands, one holding steady while the other shifts the slim bundles over one another, each in its turn. Linked by sweet grass, there is reciprocity between you. Linked by sweet grass, the holder as vital as the braider. This will be our metaphor. Braiding sweet grass is an intertwining of science, spirit, and story. Old stories and new ones that can be medicine for our broken relationship with Earth. A pharmacopoeia of healing stories that allow us to imagine a different relationship in which people and land are good medicine for each other. Will you hold the end of the bundle while I braid? Hands joined by grass. Can we bend our heads together and make a braid to honor the earth? And then I'll hold it for you while you braid too.
In the beginning there was the sky world. She fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below, but in that emptiness there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled towards them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, and so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far, and after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon. But the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air, with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon, only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative, and before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless woman. But then, the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, Here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks, from the dab of mud on Turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animals' gifts, coupled with her deep gratitude. Together, they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there, in her grasp were branches, fruits and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through a hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees and medicines spread everywhere, and now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on Turtle Island. Because Creator, in his great kindness, has made me a message bearer, I bring the message to each of you. Do not think too highly of yourself. Instead, understand the great spirit calls us to different purposes in answer to our trust in him. For just as our body has many members, and each member has a different part, it is the same way with the body of the Chosen One. We are members of His body, and each member belongs to all of us.
What might we learn from the story of Sky Woman falling? It's a different creation story than the one that we're accustomed to. What is different between the two? Well, to my ear at least, the Adam and Eve creation tale sounds a lot like crime and punishment. Now I know it's been skewed that way by theologians over the centuries, but it does seem to lack the beauty of the gratitude that is at the heart of the Sky Woman falling story. We don't have a sense of reciprocity, of all of creation working together and caring for us. It's more about us versus creation. It explains why there's hard work, why we call childbirth labor, and why labor is painful and we are struggling to work within creation. That's what our creation story leads us to. It's an explanation of why those things exist and a call for us to return to right relationship with our maker so that we might find some peace there. Where this tale is one of all of creation showing compassion and mercy in the midst of suffering and creating something new and powerful and beautiful and helpful in creation. Reciprocity is at the heart of Native American wisdom. And it's something that we don't grasp very well. We in the West especially in capitalist societies, have this understanding of quid pro quo. I give to you exactly in exchange for what you give to me. And if I can work some advantage, I'm doing it better than anyone else, right? So that we get these imbalances and injustices in our economic work, in our economic life together. We have haves and have nots. It's a consequence of the system we have created. Not that it hasn't created a better living for most people in capitalistic societies. But we have to tweak it, don't we? And perhaps we need to learn the lesson of reciprocity of the gift economy. Native teaching speaks of the gift when one goes into the natural world to find what is needed for survival, the understanding is that that animal is giving its life to feed you, and so you don't waste a bit of it. If your hunters take down a buffalo, it will feed many, many people in the village. It won't be used for the hunters to have an advantage over the gatherers, for instance. It will be used for everyone, and every bit of the buffalo will find its usage. Nothing will go to waste. And the harvest happens only in ways that are sustainable. And by living in close harmony with nature, that is understood because nature is doing just that. We don't even think that way. We think we need something and we just get the first thing that we can find. That's not how we ought to do it. We ought to be cautious and think. We ought to be clear about what we need and what we don't need. What is simply a want and a desire. But we're not encouraged to do that because consumption is what runs the economy. So more consumption means better living for everyone, right? Maybe not so. We are coming up hard against that limit where the resources that we count on, like fossil fuels, we know are going to come to an end. Where the products that we produce the things we put into the air are heating the planet to the point that there will be major consequences that we may not have time to turn around. So even if we could begin to have just a taste of the gift economy, to understand that the bounty of creation is not there for us to take all for ourselves, but to reciprocate. When a native person 
harvest something from creation, a gift is offered. As a matter of fact, when the peoples gather, the first thing that they do, the words before all else, are words of gratitude. Can you imagine if we started that way? If we understood that all of creation is a gift, wake up in the morning and be thankful for the gift of this day, of this breath, of this moment. To eat your breakfast and be aware of the effort that went into getting it to you. Much of it was not yours, but was given in exchange for something. In a gift economy, it's not that I have to give to you in order to get. It's I am thankful and grateful for the gift that you give. And then I give my gifts. And if we all give our gifts, there is a sustainable web of creation. When we look at nature, we see this sustainable web of creation, of reciprocity, of gifts, each giving its gift, whatever it may be, whatever they may be, the creatures of this planet, each giving and being their part, and it all works in sustainable balance. We might learn from that. We ought to learn from that because we are not separated from creation. We are not apart from nature. We are natural beings. But we have made our living so unnatural, so detached, that we think that we can take. Nothing can be taken. As a matter of fact, we think that we can give things that aren't ours to give. When an indigenous person receives something of the harvest, the first thing they do is give thanks, and they offer something in return. If something is picked, a flower or sweet grass, a gift of tobacco is often what is left. What might you give as a gift to the being, the creature, the life form that is giving its life for you? That may sound bizarre to our ears, but what if we began that practice? What if we just had a bit more gratitude for all of life that is around us and for the creator who is behind it all? We might look at some of the indigenous practices, the rituals that occur, and see them as silly or foolish. It's easy to look at someone else's practice and do that harder to look at our own. We look at our own practices and they all seem perfectly normal to us, even if the practice doesn't make any sense at all to an outsider. But all of our rituals and practices have a starting point. They all come out of some place. And we shouldn't be caught up in maintaining the practice, but we should be learning from them. There are reasons for our practices, but they include an orientation toward the divine. They include an attitude of gratitude. That's what the practices are meant to do. That's why we go to the gym. That's why we go on diets, right? We change our habits so that we get the results we're looking for. And they always fail if we focus so much on the results and not enough on the gains that we make slowly but surely by participating in the ritual, in the practice. That's how habits change, by just starting and celebrating the successes a step at a time. And that, my friends, is how we will save this world. Not in some big spectacular return of the divine to the creation, though that may be what happens. But let me point out, we are not on the planning committee for the return, for the homecoming of Christ. We are, however, on the welcoming committee. It is our job to be ready. And we don't know when it will happen. So we have to be ready now. And we can't get it all done at once. So we can do nothing more than to give what we have to prepare in each moment, day by day, moment by moment, doing those things that we know is our part of the committee work to make the world a place 
where we look around and perhaps the Christ has returned and we just hadn't noticed it before. Because, you know, Jesus did tell us that he was present among the least, the last, and the lost. So maybe it's more about revealing what is already real. And a critical thing to understand is that we are on a committee. It's not your work. It's not my work. It's our work. Now, each of us has to provide just that thing that we can do, that we ought to do, that is our gift. That's how this committee works. You see, we are all one body. That's what we hear in our ancient story, that we all function together, that we not only function together, but we need one another. Perhaps our creation story needs to be the creation of the body of Christ, created by fingers and toes and hands and arms and mouths and eyes. Because some of us speak and some of us sing and some of us listen and some of us see and some of us feel. And all of us need all of that. That's why we are knit together that is why each of us has our part to do, to be on this committee, to welcome the Christ, of whom we are a part. What a great and marvelous mystery that is. What a great gift. Amen. In the book Braiding Sweetgrass, Dr. Kimmerer speaks of a peculiar ritual Peculiar in that it was particular to her family. When they were at camp, her father would rise early and make coffee. And the first cup was poured out as a libation, as an offering to the great spirit, to the great creator, to the spirit of the place that they inhabited. And she thought it a bit peculiar, but also in keeping with that practice of giving the first gift. Now, it turns out there was also a practical purpose, because when you perk your coffee in a percolator, it uh, tends to be a little bit full of grounds, and that first cup in particular. So the first cup being poured out kind of unclogged the spout and made the rest of the gifts of the cups of coffee that much more pleasant. What a great idea to give our gifts in a way that makes the rest of the giving and receiving that much more pleasurable. Maybe we need more ritual in our life. Perhaps you need the ritual right now of hitting the like button for this video. Maybe you need the ritual of thinking who you will share this message with. Make it a practice. It would certainly help us. And I think it might help you to have some form of practice that helps you understand that we live if we choose in a gift economy and that your gifts matter. And we would love to have you, if you are able, provide some monetary gift to us. You can visit our website and make that gift right now or any time in the future, because these things truly matter, that we give for one another, that we understand that who we are is a gift and that what we have is likewise a gift. And we were given those with the intent of serving those who need those gifts in reciprocity. May that be your practice today and every day. May you find blessing in whatever ritual practice you partake in. Until we see you again, blessings. Dear